Okay, um, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending upon where you are in the world. Um, my name is Steve Lewis and I'm a director of Risk based in the UK. Uh, I understand you can uh, see the slides and you can hear us and it seems like um, it's uh, it's myself who's, who uh, can't actually see the slides. Um, but we're, so we'll, we'll, we'll crack on. The most important thing is everybody can hear us, so that, that's great. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, and welcome to this RISTEC seminar. The topic today is about applying looper rules for safeguards uh, in a HAZOP study and hopefully we can provide some useful and uh, practical insights for you. Uh, before we get going, a quick spot of housekeeping. Uh, what I've done is I've muted everybody so that the sound won't be distorted by uh, background noise. Uh, if you would like to ask some questions, then please use the instant messaging function. That's that little white bubble down in the left-hand corner of your screen. If you just click on that, uh, put your message in. I'll keep track of these, and what we'll do is we'll aim to cover as many of them as, as we can at the end of the session, uh, and certainly within the sort of 35 minutes we've got allocated to um, uh, to the uh, to the webinar today. Um, Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly introduce RISTEC uh, to those of you who don't know RISTEC. Um, so RISTEC is a independent and specialist risk and safety management uh, provider. Uh, we're part of TUV Rhineland, which is a sort of two billion euro technical services and inspection company. Um, we are a global business. We've got over 300 people operating uh, in, in different offices uh, around the world. Um, our core business really is, is consulting. We provide a wide range of risk and safety management services, uh, but we also deliver uh, learning solutions, so online and classroom training and postgraduate education, including up to MSc level. Um, we also provide um, sort of some resources, so associates to work at client sites, uh, we also deliver some inspection services and more recently we've been uh, involved in uh, risk and safety management activities in the field of uh, research and development. So that's just a quick introduction to uh, RISTEC. I'll now uh, briefly introduce uh, Graham. So Graham Beard is a principal consultant based in our Dubai office. Um, Graham's primary experience is in uh, process safety. Um, he's uh, in particular a sort of specialist in HAZOP and LOPA and is an approved uh, chairman uh, by a number of major uh, international and national oil companies. Um, so with that I'll, I'll hand over to you Graham and let you let you get going. Thank you. Okay, thank you Steve. Uh, hello everyone. So I'm looking forward to delivering uh, this subject. I'm very passionate about HAZOPs and LOPAs and uh, so I hope everybody will enjoy uh, the presentation. He says as he tries to move the screen down, which is not. And my screen isn't moving, apologies. Right, okay, hopefully everybody can can see the PowerPoint. Okay, so the talk tonight is about applying rules in a HAZOP workshop. So a HAZOP is a structured and systematic examination of a process. It's probably the most detailed study you will do for a, for a process, um, and they can run from several days to, to weeks, and in some cases they can go to months. They are hard work, um, but they are power. It's a powerful technique to examine the safety of a process. But it's very structured and very systematic, and because of that, it can be hard work. The Hassel methodology has rules, and these have to be followed to make the study effective. But the low fatigue technique has come along. And this has its own set of rules, which, although LOPA can be seen as a separate technique and a separate study, 
it can be incorporated or some of the rules can be incorporated into the HAZOP workshop to benefit the assessment of the safeguards. So applying both the HAZOP and the LOPA rules in a HAZOP workshop can help us correctly assess a HAZOP cause consequence scenario and determine if the likelihood of the consequence is being reduced to an acceptable level, acceptable frequency. However, there are times then it's not beneficial to follow the rules and we'll touch on the times when you will not follow those rules. Okay, so quick overview of the HAZOP history. It's been around for for nearly 60 years. It's a well-developed methodology and it's many companies have their own HAZOP standard. There are international standards uh, for the HAZOP, OSHA, CCPS, ICME. Um, they're international standards, but as I say, most oil and gas major companies have their own HAZOP procedure. Okay, sorry, Graham. If I could, sorry, Graham. If I could just interrupt you. Um, quite a few uh, people are saying they've lost the slides um, right, from okay. you. So let, let's let's try. You could let me um, uh, close try. and try and react. If that doesn't work, I because you sent them. I've got them as well, so I could try it. Yeah, yeah I notice I've just lost the yellow border, but it's I've got it back now. So hopefully, can you tell me if people are seeing that, Steve? Yeah, okay, that's it, everybody's back on. Okay, good, sorry about that. Okay, that's the HAZOP history. It's been around for 60 years, well developed and understood by most people. So just a, a quick overview of what a HAZOP study is, stands for hazard and operability, shouldn't forget the operability side. Uh, structured and systematic, uh, it can cover processes, it can cover procedures uh, to identify and evaluate the hazards and operability problems using a series of guide words to identify deviations from the normal process conditions. It is a cause driven method and the following main questions are asked in the HAZOP. What's the intent of the system being examined? Is there a potential to deviate from this intention? What are the causes of deviation? What are the consequences of deviation? What are our documented safeguards? And then a key one, what are those safeguards adequate for the consequence we've identified? It's carried out, carried out by a multidisciplinary team and it can be effectively used as a technique for any process that has a PNID. Okay, there are rules of HAZOP. And typically, uh, here are some typical rules that hopefully people who are familiar with HAZOP will easily recognize. Calls are within the node, but consequences can be anywhere. The recorded consequence must be unmitigated. By that we mean all safeguards fail to work, including operator action. And the recorded consequence must detail the impact on people, assets, and environment. We haven't finished the consequence until we have said what the impact is on the people, assets, and environment, and given them a severity. However, as uh, the original HAZOP technique, when it came to assessing the adequacy of safeguards, it was generally left to the judgment of the team to determine this. You would have your safeguards listed and you would review them as a team and you would come to a view as to whether the team felt the, those safeguards were adequate to reduce the likelihood of that consequence to an acceptable level. Now, of course, that judgment will be different and will differ from team to team based on the knowledge and experience of the team and the facilitator. But that was the process. Uh, the HAZOP is a judgment-based process where you, hopefully you have the right people in the room to make those correct judgments. Right, layers of protection analysis. This 
uh, was originally first came into being in the in the late 80s and early 90s and in 2001 the Center for Chemical Process Safety uh, who are part of the AI Chemie uh, issued a document called the layer protection analysis simplified process risk assessment in 2001 and it probably was not totally adopted and accepted by industry for at least another 10 years and uh, I just extracted a section from that document uh, and the key thing I want to point out there is LOPA is limited to evaluating a single cause consequence pair as a scenario that was the original concept for the LOPA technique um, what has happened in, in the last five, ten years is a lot of oil and gas majors have, have uh, ad, um, modified that te technique so that you are investigating all the causes of a consequence. You are not looking at a single cause consequence pair or a row in a HAZOP. You pull together in your calculation all the causes of the same hazard and do your calculation based on that. Um, but as originally developed by the CCPS, it was for a single cause consequence pair. What is LOPA? Uh, it is used to determine the mitigated or safeguarded frequency of a hazardous event and allows comparison to the target frequency for that hazard. I'm not going into great detail on what is a HAZOP and what is a LOPA because uh, this, this webinar is about the rules uh, and I'm not going into the, the details of these both techniques and hopefully most of the people attending have a good understanding of HAZOP and LOPA. So um, and what LOPA provides is a consistent basis for judging whether there are sufficient safeguards to achieve the target frequency, i.e. removes some of the subjectivity in the assessment of the safeguard adequacy. Remember I said that the HAZOT was a judgment based process where the team would make a judgment on the adequacy of the safeguards. Well now LOPA allows us to make a consistent basis for judging those safeguards and if you've got the rules for that for that process then regardless of who's in the team what country you're in what process you're covering you should get the same results because the LOPA technique will apply a consistent basis for that judgment and probably most of us recognize that the LOPA technique is the most popular uh, technique used for determining safety integrity levels for SIFs or IPFs Okay, the LOPA takes information from the HAZOP and you can see the process there. Again, I'm not going into great detail on this slide. Um, I just want to point out that the, the HAZOP and LOPA go hand in hand and effectively a good HAZOP will give you a good LOPA and the poor HAZOP will not give you the information you need to do your assessment properly. So you can see that uh, where I've indicated there where the HAZOP info on the consequences, on the causes of those consequences, on the safeguards, those consequences are all identified in the HAZOP and that information gets pulled into the LOPA assessment. Okay, so assessment of the safeguards. The HAZOP will typically list all safeguards, both strong and weak. This is the approach I take when I do a HAZOP. I will list everything that I see documented. I know full well that some of those safeguards are not good, but I will list them because I want to make sure that everything that's documented as a safeguard is listed in my HAZOP. Now you could argue why am I listing it if it's in the safeguard column, but uh, if I don't list it when someone's reviewing the HAZOP after the workshop, they might say, well, you missed the safeguard. Um, so I don't want that situation. I want to list all the safeguards that are installed, but fully recognizing some are good and some are not so good. 
So, as I said, the, low, the HAZOP technique, uh, before the LOPA technique was available, was uh, the judgment of the adequacy of the safeguards was, was the judgment of the team. They would look at the safeguards recorded and they would come to that judgment as to they were there, whether they were adequate or not. But now the LOPA technique allows us to check, test the effectiveness and validity of these safeguards. The LOPA study can be done as a separate study to the HAZOP, and, and many companies do that. But also, many companies combine the HAZOP and LOPA. And once you know the LOPA rules, as a chairman, you would want to see them applied in a HAZOP workshop because they provide that consistent challenge of the safeguards and you're removing that judgment-based process that the HAZOP technique was, was using before. So the first step in the assessment of the safeguards that we've listed in the HAZOP, remember, we've listed everything, good safeguards and not so good safeguards. We've listed them all. But our first thing is to determine if those safeguards are independent protection layers. Again, I'm not going into the you know, explaining the full LOPA technique here and the terminology. Hopefully, uh, many of you are familiar with the term independent protection layers. So as our first check is, I've listed every safeguard that's documented. Is it an independent protection layer? So what is an independent protection layer? It must be capable of preventing or mitigating an accident sequence from proceeding to a defined undesirable endpoint or a consequence. So it must be capable of preventing or mitigating. It might be stating the obvious, but it's got to be preventing or mitigating the consequence. It must be independent of the cause. So it mustn't be linked to the failure that we're looking at that's caused the consequence. It has to be totally independent of that. It also must be independent of any other safeguard. And it must be capable of being tested against the defined performance. And that performance might be it, the valves have got to close in a set uh, time. And there might be a requirement for the valves to be tight shot off, in which case um, we need to ensure that the leakage rates are acceptable. So it must be capable of being tested and, and against the defined performance. So what we are saying is effectively of all our safeguards that we've listed in our HAZOP, if we are then reviewing those and determining which of those are IPLs, once, it's an I, once we're saying it's an IPL, we are effectively saying it is a reliable safeguard with a defined reliability and we can claim it to reduce the likelihood of the consequence. And on the other hand, if it's not an IPL, then we cannot claim it to reduce the likelihood of the consequence. We would discount it completely. If that safeguard was not an IPL, we would discount it in the LOPA assessment. And really, in the HAZOP judgment of the safeguards, we would discount it as well because it doesn't meet the rules of an IPL. Okay, just a slide which just emphasizes again what our IPL should be. Um, should be effective. It's got to prevent or mitigate the hazard. It's got to be auditable. It's got to be testable. It's got to be independent. And if it meets those three criteria, it is an IPL, and we can recognize it as a reliable safeguard that we know will reduce the likelihood of a hazard. Now, of course, that effectiveness check should have been done as part of a good HAZOP study. Um, but sometimes, it, 
I, probably a lot of us will recognize you can get good hazards, you can get bad hazards, where the challenge of safeguards can be variable, but a good hazard should have had that effectiveness check of the safeguards, because if they weren't effective, then we should never have been uh, claiming them as, as, as a good safeguard. Okay, so just some examples of effectiveness. We would only claim a pressure relief valve as effective if it was documented to pass the full flow of fluid for the overpressurization case being considered. It's got to pass the full flow and it's got to be documented. You know, when sometimes uh, we're sitting in the HAZOP, uh, we're looking at a catas catastrophic event, you know, we don't want to rely on verbal statements from people. We need documents to confirm that the relief valve is big enough. So that documented pit part is very important. Um, we would only claim a PV as, effect, as effective if it was documented to pass the full flow of fluid for the overpressurization case being considered. We would only claim a trip as effective if it closed all the valves necessary to prevent the consequence. So that's what we mean by effective, and that effectiveness has to be challenged in the HAZOP. You know, that challenge includes, please show me documents. If you're telling me it's large enough, please show me the document that shows the calculation to uh, prove that the relief valve was correctly sized, or PV valve to flare. If we're going to claim it uh, as being effective, it's got to pass the full flow. Please show me the calculation that demonstrates that PV is correctly sized. Okay. Uh, auditable, auditable, example one, non-return valves. Um, those of people amongst us who, who, who do has ops will know that non-return valves are, 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 are <laughs> cause a lot of problems in has ops. So a non-return valve prevent, prevents bulk reverse flow. However, in many situations, a non-return valve will never be tested in its life. Therefore, against the rules of LOPA, it cannot be claimed as an IPL. It cannot be claimed to reduce the likelihood of reverse flow because it has never been tested. With the, you can see with the rules of LOPA, it's, it's, it's black or white. It's yes or no. Is it an IPL? Yes or no? There's no halfway ground here. It's yes or no. So for an untested non-return valve, we would only be happy for it to be a safeguard if the consequence of reverse flow was negligible. Okay. And another example of auditable, uh, an IPF, instrumented protection function, a safety instrumented function, or a TRIP. It should have an agreed testing interval it may have performance requirements, as we've discussed, leakage rates, closure times. If the trip has not been tested or the performance requirements have not been tested, then against the rules of LOPA, it cannot be claimed as an IPL. As I said, it's yes or no. Okay, Inde Independency, uh, example one. So I've got several of these. This is one of the more complicated areas and, and an area where uh, it's easy to go wrong in determining IPLs on independence. So some examples here. So we've got a high, high pressure trip, PAHH001, and a low, low flow trip, FALL001. And in the HAZOP, they've both been claimed as safeguards for hazard X against the same cause. And we've listed in the HAZOP that the PAHH001 closes XV001 and XV002. And we've stated that the FALL001 closes XV001 and XV003. But we know from the assessment of the consequence, it is only the closure of XV001 that prevents the hazard. The closure of XV002 and 3, that's a good thing to do but it has absolutely nothing to do with the hazard that we're looking at. 
so we can discount them. So it's closure of XV001 that is the key to preventing the hazard. But both the PAHH01 and FAL01 share the same final element, XV001. They are not independent to each other. And what we mean by that, if XV001 is stuck open, it doesn't matter that PAHH001 is telling it to close or FAL01 is telling it to close. It will not close. So we've got a shared final element and we cannot claim both the PAHH and the FAL as IPLs. We can only take one of them. Okay, another example. Um, people who are familiar with compressors will know uh, that they will be high, high pressure trips, low, low pressure trips, high temperature trips, low flow trips, vibration trips. And again, in the HAZOP, you would have listed each individual trip as a safeguard. But are they IPLs? Now, typically all of those trips that I've listed there will carry out the same function. They will trip the compressor, they will open a safety relay and cut the power supply, they will close the inlet and outlet valves. So all of those trips, the high, high pressure, low, low pressure, temperature, flow, vibration, they will all carry out the same actions. Therefore, they are not independent to each other. Therefore, if I was doing a loper on the compressor for a hazard that was listing two or three of those trips as safeguards, I would only be able to claim one of them as an independent protection layer. And the others I would have to discount. Okay, another example, safeguard not independent of calls. So I have a vessel uh, which I'm going to flood. So I've got a feed flow coming in. I've got a level control valve here. LCO29 controlling it. I've got a shutdown valve here to prevent low, 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 low level gas blow by. So the following are causes for high level. If this valve went closed, I would not remove the liquid and I would start to flood, fill the vessel. If the level control valve failed, I would not remove the liquid and I'd level would start to increase. So my safeguard for high level is LAHH030 and that will shut the inlet valve. Now of course shutting that inlet valve will cause another hazard but I'm not interested in that hazard. We will be assessing that somewhere else. We are looking at the high level issue. So is the LAHH030 a safeguard or an IPL, probably the more important word, IPL for all the causes of high level. So what are the causes of high level? The LCV could go closed due to loss of air. The LCV could get a spurious signal from the LT, LIC, i.e. it's reading low and it will go closed. The XV30A could go closed due to loss of air. It could be deliberately closed because I'm trying to prevent a downstream upset. And XVO30A could go closed due to an incorrect signal from LT LIC 030. Just going back so you can see loss of air or, or an incorrect signal from this LT30 will make this go closed. Loss of air or incorrect signal from LC029 will gate the level control valve go closed. So is the LAH030 a safeguard for all the causes? So the LCV fails closed due to a loss of air. Yes, it's a safeguard for that. Uh, incorrectly, a spurious signal from the LT LIC209. Yes, it's uh, a safeguard for that. The XV30A fails closed due to loss of air. <clears throat> yes, it's a safeguard for that. For the deliberately closing, yes, it's a safeguard for that. But for the XV incorrectly closed due to the LT LIC failure, LT reading low, 
it is not a safeguard so I'll just take you back to the drawing so what we've said is that one of the reasons this valve can go closed is if this LT30 is reading low and it sent a spurious signal shut this valve but because the high high level trip is on the same transmitter if I've said one of the causes is the spurious signal reading low I cannot claim it as a safeguard I cannot claim the high high level trip as a safeguard because it's on the transmitter that has gone wrong to cause the valve to go close and give me <clears throat> high level so my high high level trip is not independent of the cause and you can see how you know by breaking down the causes into the individual reasons then you you, you can easily see uh, if you've got that independence or not right so quick okay so the benefit there hopefully you can see there is a benefit of applying LOPA rules in the hazard workshop so again the HAZOP is a judgment based process and we must never forget that but the LOPA rules of looking challenging those safeguards are they effective are they independent are they auditable we can make a consistent detailed assessment of those safeguards and make a judgment as to whether we think they're good or bad safeguards so that LOPA process has now allows us to uh, go through the HAZOP safeguards and we might now discount safeguards which we previously thought were reasonable and we might have used them in our judgment to say yes we think we're okay but the LOPA rules involves that more detailed challenge and we might say actually that safeguard is not independent it's not effective or fully effective and it's never tested so you can hopefully see the LOPA rules has really helped us challenge those safeguards as to whether they're good safeguards or bad safeguards okay now just to finish off with but there are times to not follow the rules so one of the key hazard rules is the written consequence must be based on no safeguards working and no operators taking any action that's a key rule um, but what I'm saying is there are times not to follow this rule and they're typically going to be time related and I call this a quote being credible we want our consequences to be not worst case but worst case credible so some examples uh, and this is a real example that came up in a HAZOP I was doing uh, loading an FBSO which is floating production storage and offloading uh, tanker that is used and so if we fill too many tanks on the starboard side of the ship we will lead to ship imbalance now the hazard rule is no safeguards work no operators take any action so following that consequence to the to the end point we will turn the FPSO vote FPSO over and it will sink so that's what we would get from applying strictly the hazard rule but we should identify how long it takes for this to happen so let's say it's eight hours at the maximum loading rate now we should jump to the safeguards the question we should ask ourselves is it credible for the operators on board the FPSO to take no action even when they are walking around at an angle on the boat so they're walking around on the FBSO the FBSO is starting to tilt and they're walking around and doing nothing about it so this was a real example uh, which was discussed and it was the agreement of the team or the judgment of the team that it was not a credible scenario for the sinking of the SPSO it was not credible that the operators on board the FBSO would do nothing when they are walking at an angle around the ship now there might be some other consequences lesser less severe consequences but uh, on the more severe consequence of uh, uh, tipping the FPS over it was decided not to be a credible scenario 
Another example, loss of continuous corrosion inhibitor injection to the pipeline. Um, whenever I do corrosion inhibitor injection, I will always ask the question, what are the immediate consequences? And typically, the answer to that is no immediate consequences. You would have built up a layer of the corrosion inhibitor on the pipeline or piping, and it would take several days or weeks before that would get worn away. So you would then ask that question, you know, how long would it take for that layer of, of, of corrosion inhibitor to be worn away? And typically, the answer comes back, well, it, it will take days, sometimes weeks, of no injection to result in a consequence. So again, the TASOP team can make a judgment. Is it credible that no action is taken by an operator uh, when we've lost the injection or hasn't taken any action for weeks? Now, typically, most operators, they'll have uh, someone check the chemical injection systems daily. Now, no safeguard is 100% reliable. That get, might get missed for a day, a couple of days, maybe. But what we're saying is it would have to be not done for weeks before we got a consequence. So again, it's the judgment of the team as to is it credible to go weeks without taking any action? And in most cases, it's, it's the judgment of the team that it is not credible. So. That's uh, the conclusion uh, of, of what I presented today on the rules in a HAZOT workshop. The application of the rules and LOPA rules are essential for a thorough and consistent assessment of the hazards of, of a process. But it is important that we recognize that we want to deal with worst case credible scenarios. And as a result, there are times when the use of the rules should be challenged and we don't follow them strictly. Okay. That's it. I think uh, 31 minutes on, on my clock, so I hit the 30 minutes. OK, well, well over done. to you, Steve. Yeah, well done, Graham. Th th thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, we did get going uh, a little bit late. Uh, apologies for the uh, the technical issues at the start, but we certainly got some time to get through some of these questions. Um, so I'll, I'll um, get the first one quiet. Fairly early on, Graham, when you were talking about uh, judgment in HAZOP, um, the question is, um, are there any standards or restrictions you should be referring to when you are applying judgment? Uh, if you couldn't find a similar system when you're analyzing failure causes, you know, how, how do you make a judgment? It's quite a broad you, question. You, that, but. Yeah, you've, you've got to hope you've got the right people in the room. Now, you know, RISTEC provides HAZOP chairman and, uh, and typically the client or contractor will assemble the team. Um, and you do, as a chairman, you do hope that the right team has been assembled. Now, I'll be honest, you, if you haven't got the right team, then you, you quickly find that out as a chairman on the first day of the HAZOP. But, you know, you have to you keep moving forward. Um, you know, what would happen if you didn't have the right team and you didn't feel the team were qualified to make those judgments is that you'd end up with a lot more recommendations um, to go away and assess a scenario um, to determine um, if, if you felt that more safeguards were, were needed. So, but we, you know, the HAZOP is a judgment-based process and, and we must whilst the LOPA technique has come along and is very helpful to a HAZOP team in doing that assessment of safeguards we must not take away the judgment based process that the, the HAZOP brings us um, but as I, as, as I said in my presentation that judgment based process can be variable depending on the quality of the team now you know and hope you know, if the, the chairman hopefully has the the confidence the experience to um, question the validity of the team you know if you look at a lot of uh, company procedures on HAZOP they say that the chairman has the right to stop a HAZOP if he doesn't feel he's got the right people present okay thanks Graham um, a question from uh, Julio um, 
which I think is really getting at uh, who says you have to do a loper, <laughs> I think is a kind of paraphrasing. Um, exactly. Aware of the OSHA PSM standard, uh, which certainly requires PHAs, you know, predominantly interpreted as HAZOPs to be ex executed, uh, but doesn't appear to discuss lopers. So, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, what do I want as a, as a chairman? I want to make sure that the process that you're assessing has been thoroughly challenged, that the, that the, the cause consequences have been correctly identified and detailed, and the safeguards have been challenged. You know, the, the HAZOP is not about recording the safeguards you see on the PNID and in the cause and effects. It's all about challenging those safeguards. Are those safeguards good enough for the consequence? So the LOPA technique has given me additional tools as a chairman to make sure that those safeguards are challenged properly. So it's a tool that I want to use yeah. to make sure that the safeguards have been properly challenged. Is, is there a, a, a requirement out there that you shall do it? Well, maybe not, but the HAZOP chairman's job is to make sure safeguards are challenged and then they they are suitable for the consequence that's been identified so i'm going to use any technique available to me to make sure that those safeguards have been challenged okay great and i think there's a follow-on question uh, so so which which uh, has op scenario should be passed forward for lopa the way so some companies have rules so above a certain severity that they will say that automatically goes to LOPA. Um, so people who are familiar with risk matrices and or severity ranking, you know, above a certain severity rank, it automatically goes to, to LOPA. Now, of course, if you're doing SIL classification, all the loops that are, or, or all, the, all the IPS which are preventing uh, consequences will be looked at anyway and you you would lose the loper technique there but uh, you know, that some so some companies will do it on the severity rank but clearly if you're doing seal classification every every consequence that is prevented by a ipf will go to loper or will go to the seal classification process and loper is the best technique to be applied in that process yeah yeah. OK. Um, there's a sort of specific question. I think this is when you were talking about um, the requirement for uh, documentation to be available. And the question is, uh, if the PSV, I think that should be, if the PSV sizing data is not available, but the design basis includes the case to be considered in the PSV sizing, uh, can we consider that PSV as a, as a, as a safeguard and IPL? The, the, the documentation is very important again this is down to the judgment of the team or the chair you know if you're looking at a very low severity consequence um, you know you're not going to challenge hard on the safeguards if you're looking at a catastrophe you are going to challenge hard on those safeguards and included in that challenging hard is is checking documentation we, we are the HAZOP is not a a process where you record verbal statements of people. You know, it, it, this is a serious study. It can involve life and death. So we do not want to rely on verbal statements from the team. So we do need the documents available. Now, there are times when you, you suspect that the PSV is large enough, but you have no proof. So what I would do in that situation in the HAZOP, you would record the recommendation to, to provide the documentation or demonstrate the PSV is large enough. Now, if you're going to LOPA, you can look at both scenarios. You can do the calculation with the PSV excluded, and you can do the calculation with the PSV present and knowing that it's adequately sized. And you can then give the result of uh, of that loper or the seal classification and you might say the high high pressure trip should be uh, seal three if the psv is not proved to be large enough or it can be seal one if the psv is large enough 
or if it's found it's not large enough then you have a recommendation that you change the PSV and if it is changed then of course you can go with the SIL 1 uh, for the trip okay great um, do you consider loss of power to equipment as a factor to determine independence loss of power most uh, most safeguards will be fail close so basically on on loss of air or loss of power they should go to their fail safe position so loss of power could lead to a cause of a consequence and then you would assess it accordingly you know, what's the consequences and then what of our safeguards um, loss of power uh, our safeguards shouldn't rely um, well sorry that's let's start again every safeguard can fail every safe every when we talk about the reliability of safeguards we talk about a probability of failure on demand and the more reliable safeguards have a um, a low probability on demand and, and a unreliable or high probability on demand so we recognize you know there's no such thing as a hundred percent reliable safeguard every safeguard can fail now we can calculate the reliability of our safeguards uh, we can create fault trees and and if the power supply is a factor in in the in the PFD of our safeguard then we would have included it in the calculation and if it if that power loss was effectively resulting in our probably our reliability of our safeguard being too low the power loss issue would have to be uh, addressed okay thanks um, question from Nikolai uh, in a loper um, is it mandatory that the IPL is within the node or can it be outside you know similarly in Hazop you know the safeguards in the node or can it also be outside no so remember you know, the reason that Hazop is so powerful is very systematic and structured so when you, you your your cause is within your node but your consequence can be anywhere it might be several nodes away and then when it comes to safeguards you're only looking at the safeguards which apply to that consequence and again obviously those con those safeguards will, will can be anywhere but they you know the key thing is those safeguards are specific to the consequence you've written might sound obvious but uh, that's the case so you, you, you with the hazard you always you're compartmentalizing everything uh, and, and you're you know you're concentrating on a cause consequence line and on the consequence you're now going to just look at the safeguards I've got for that consequence and forget everything else you just concentrate all your efforts on that cause consequence pair and the safeguards that go with that pair wherever they may be thanks Graham um, another question here we've probably got time just for maybe a couple more and then, then we I think we need to wrap up um, in the case of the compressor trips so I think this was referring to your, to your example uh, in the case of the compressor trips having different detection transmitters but the same final control element could the PFD, so the probability of failure on demand for the trip systems combined SIFs, be used instead of a single loop initiation? You are you apply the IPL check as part of your um, assessment of the safeguard. So you know, it's the lo the the loper as uh, is a rule driven process and you would have lit so if we go back to your hazard remember we would have listed every safeguard that we see documented so we might have for a compressor consequence we might have listed six or seven safeguards but then you do the IPL check and it's it, it's it's black and white you look at them and the, and you claim you maybe you claim your first trip and then you find this okay and now I've got another trip listed in my has up is it independent to the trip I've claimed above and it's if it's not 
you discount it. it it's black and white it's no you do not count it that's the seal classification process it's a rule driven process you follow the rules there's no debate on this is that safeguard no let's take the vibra let's say um we've got surging on the compressor we might have a high high pressure trip for a shutting of a compressor yes we got vibration trips but it would do exactly the same thing as the high high pressure trip on the discharge we would discount the vibration trip completely and we would only move forward with the PAHH. That's the rules of HAZOP. Sorry, the rules of LOPA. Okay, Graham, thanks. I think we better make this the very last question, uh, and it's a nice, uh, it's a nice tricky one for you to end on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thinking outside of the box, can LOPA be utilised in the management of change process? Well, the manage okay. So let, let's the first thing in a management of change process is that you l someone should be looking at within the company of the change that's being proposed, and the decision is made as to whether a safety review is needed. Yes or no, and if it's no, then you don't do anything more. If you then say yes, we do need to do a safety review, that could be a desktop review or it could be a HAZOP, that decision has got to be made. So if you've decided that that MOC needs a HAZOP, it just goes through the, the normal process of a HAZOP, cause, consequence, safeguards. And then what I'm saying is you use your knowledge of the LOPA rules for challenging a safeguard in that process that you're going through. Okay, brilliant, Graham. Yeah, thanks very much. I think we need to wrap up now. Um, okay. What we will do, everybody, is we'll make a recording available to you. Um, hopefully, we'll get that to you um, certainly by the end of the week. Um, so, if you have any questions arising from what you've heard today, uh, or you like any information on our services, then do just get in touch with us um, by email, or I'm, I'm, I'm sure Graham would be happy if you could contact him directly. Uh, there's some e email addresses um, on the slides at the end there or you can just go to our website and there's plenty of places you can send an inquiry into us and you'll find its way to the right place okay so thank you uh, Graham again uh, thank you everybody for your attention uh, we do appreciate you uh, tuning into these but there's more webinars to come so sign up to those if you're if you're interested and if as long as you guys keep uh, turning up I guess we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing them so uh, stay safe, stay secure, uh, have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.